Hello everybody, my name is Helen Hal. I'm author of The Revision Revolution, also currently working as Director of English at Bluecoat School in Oldham. Thank you so much for logging on to this Teach It talk, which is going to look at revision and also effective study skills. So I've split it into two parts. The first part looking at why we need a revolution, in my opinion, of how we teach revision, the kind of established way of approaching revision in our schools. And then part two, looking at those practical strategies of how to implement effective revision and a real culture of effective study skills throughout your own schools. So I'm going to start by talking about some of the research that I did for the book. And as part of this, I did do some student voice asking them, first of all, what do they understand by the term revision? But also, how do they feel about it? When do they feel like they should revise? Why do they need to revise? Um, and those kind of questions. And I found, unsurprisingly, really, that two thirds of students linked revision to tests to assessments and to exams and thought you should only revise before a test. So there was no wider understanding of the kind of learning behind revision, linking it to things that they're learning in lessons or the idea of long term learning. It was all linked to a means to an ends, really, um, that idea that you should revise just in order to achieve that outcome of a good test result. And as a consequence of this, there were really negative associations with revision, that it was boring, difficult, stressful. And I think most heartbreaking of all, one student did say that they just didn't know how to do it. And I think I'm going to argue through this presentation that actually it's quite an exciting era within education where we do have access to research and evidence around the best bets for our students. So we do know as educators what the best approaches to revision are. We do have access to a whole range of effective study skills. So making those explicit and modeling them makes this kind of comment by a student of not knowing how to revise absolutely unnecessary. Um, and arguably, if we are getting those students who have no idea how to revise, what we're risking is the widening of the achievement gap, which I'm going to talk more about in this presentation. So, first of all, why do we need a revolution? Well, revolutions emerge when there's discontent around the established way of doing things. Within this established way of doing things, there's usually an inherent injustice around who holds the power, which might mean social mobility is difficult, if not impossible, for certain groups of people. What does this have to do with revision? Well, there's an established approach to revision in schools which means that the only students likely to succeed are those who already hold certain advantages in life. In the introduction to the book, I talk about my own quite positive, really, experience with revision, but there's a couple of massive disclaimers here. The first one being that I was lucky, I was extremely lucky with some of the advantages I had. I had academic parents, I had um, a group of friends who really wanted to do well and therefore they were a very positive influence on me um, and I had an environment, a home environment which was conducive to study. I even had a private tutor especially in the subjects that, where I struggled. Not every student has those things and that's why revision for me became a social justice issue because actually every student should have access to the best bets of how to revise effectively effective study methods and revision is not something that was ever taught when I was in school so you know lots around like you need to revise but you know revision is is important it's it, it will have an impact on your exam results but not really anything about how to revise and also as educators, obviously our aim reaches far beyond rote learning. And this brings me to my second disclaimer. So I did do really well in the subjects that I struggled with, um, things like maths and science. However, I don't remember any of that learning or, or very, very little. So in terms of our aims as educators, where we want students to have a foundational knowledge of our subjects and be able to take that into further and higher education or take that into their career path, whatever that may be, by doing things like cramming, which I absolutely did do, 
they're not going to remember that learning. They might get a good re exam result and we all want our students to get good re exam results, but obviously it is about more than that. So revision, the established way. There's an image of a monster here and I just want to explain this metaphor. As an English teacher, I was obviously going to be using metaphors in this presentation. Um, because students aren't necessarily explicitly taught how to revise, it becomes monstrous to them. And we saw that in the student voice slide, that there are students who will have very negative associations with revision. So it's unfamiliar, it's completely abstract. They don't have that repertoire of concrete strategies, which I'm gonna talk about in the how section of this presentation, the repertoire of strategies we can offer them. Therefore, it's not only unfamiliar, but it's also frightening. You know, they've no idea how to approach it. Therefore, a lot of students simply run and hide from it. And, and unfortunately, it is particularly those students who don't have the advantages in life that I just described. And then going back to that idea that I mentioned earlier about it being a social justice issue. Um, and we're trying to narrow the gap by revolutionising our approach to revision. So what do I mean by the established way then? Well, here are some of the features of how revision might be taught in schools. So as we saw earlier in the student voice slide, students associate in revision as just for exams. So we might say to students, you know, a week or a couple of weeks before an assessment, start revising. Actually, we want to make those study habit, habits part of learning, part of the curriculum, habitual, not, not associated with exams, at all or certainly not just associated with exams something mysterious or unattainable that they, they just it's just really abstract they, they're not sure what revision should look like um solitary and silent now revision can be solitary and silent it does have its place but in the second half of this presentation i am going to suggest some social activities with revision that, that absolutely have their place and can be very effective. So things like students teaching one another, which then activates those metacognitive strategies as well. Um, and, and I also think that if we are advocating revision purely as solitary and silent, then it becomes very intimidating for those same students who are just not sure how to do it. So they might be sitting in their bedroom, it's silent, and, and they've just got no idea how to even begin that revision process. Fa failure is obviously absolutely massive and contributes to those negative emotions. Revision for more privileged students, as we've already explored, cramming, last minute interventions and after school revision. How many of us have or currently do work in schools where it's year 11 intervention and it, and it might be a bit panicky, you know, plugging those gaps last minute. Um, probably quite ineffective, not dissimilar to cramming. Um, often there's a chasm as well between revision at school and the study skills needed for further and higher education. So I'm going to talk later about certain skills that students will be expected to use in college and university that we can absolutely be teaching in school and it's going to be beneficial for us, but it's also going to smooth that transition into higher education, opening doors, hopefully, for students who may not previously have considered those routes. Little or no understanding of strengths and weaknesses, so the importance of students reflecting on a study session and being able to see what they need to go over in subsequent sessions, so that session becomes much more meaningful then, and they're not just revising anything and everything, it's tailored, it's streamlined, they know they're adding value. Threatening language. So how many of us, me included, have been um, guilty of saying things like revise or you'll fail, your future depends on these exam results, that kind of language that just adds to your revision as, as a threatening monster. So shifting away from that rhetoric to actually make it even enjoyable. De I'm definitely going to argue that it can be something enjoyable. Completion of past papers, which again, like the silent and solitary, it does have its place, but um, worst case scenario, if it's all students are doing, then they may be actually just embedding some very bad habits because they're not necessarily adding any value. If they're just completing past paper after past paper, um, are they improving or are they just repeating the same mistakes? It, you know, it's not necessarily um, effective use of that time.
Rereading and highlighting are two fairly ineffective and passive strategies, but I am going to suggest little tweaks to those that would make them highly effective, possibly non-existent. So we all have students who don't revise at all, but perhaps it's not their fault. Perhaps us as educators need to be showing them those tangible strategies um, and modelling them as part of routine so that they have different effective strategies to choose from, which links to little or no modelling of how to revise. OK, so powerful teaching, excellent book if you haven't read it. And it factored hugely in my research for the revision revolution because it is packed with effective revision strategies. And um, what they do do in this book is they categorise students. I think this is useful in thinking about the social justice issue here. So group one tend to be students who learn easily, retain information through the use of feedback. They generally do well in all their lessons. Group two, who, this is the largest group, includes students who learn best when a topic is introduced, followed by review and reinforcement through feedback, additional review and reinforcement through feedback. So best practice, lots of retrieval, lots of revisiting, and, and they will do fairly well. Group three, however, are the students who, despite all this good practice, will still struggle. They'll still struggle to retain information. And this frustration will impact on motivation. And therefore, we have this kind of vicious cycle that I'm going to talk about in the next slide, where they, they, it's quite likely that they will give up. So we need to be thinking about this group three a lot of the time when we look at the explicit modelling of revision strategies and the repeated modelling of those strategies. So we're giving every single group of students the opportunities to do well with their revision. So vicious and virtuous cycle. Um, ultimately students may get stuck in this vicious cycle so they don't know how to revise they're not sure how to set goals or they're unable to set them therefore they don't revise or they revise ineffectively they have a negative perception of revision it may cause anxiety stress it may involve being told off for not doing well with their revision or, or not revising at all and they experience failure this, it's difficult to break that cycle if revision isn't modeled to them the virtuous cycle then, what we're aiming to shift it to, is students knowing how to revise, they can set goals and reflect independently so they can use those skills of metacognition. They therefore revise effectively and routinely, they're able to select the most appropriate strategies for their revision. They have a positive attitude towards revision, they may even enjoy it because it's non-threatening and it's accessible and therefore they experience success. So the rest of this presentation will suggest ways to move towards this virtuous cycle. So first of all, we obviously need to pay attention to the science and specifically the science of memory. It's important that recall or retrieval is utilised for knowledge to enter long term memory. So this involves a lot of activities where students will retrieve information from memory. So they're not looking at notes, and um, they may look at their notes after having attempted to retrieve information, but that kind of what we call would call a desirable difficulty of trying to recall the information just from their head will pay off in the long term. Generative learning activities such as self-explaining and teaching which I'm going to be talking about in section two of this presentation are effective for remembering key information. And this is why oracy is so, so powerful. I'm going to be mentioning this as well later on. Spaced or distributed practice is much more effective than cramming. And we know that from research within pedagogy and the science of memory, but it's finding ways to show students how to space and distribute their own revision so that it does enter long term memory. This image of a spider web is to represent schema. So schema is a network of understanding that goes far beyond memorizing facts. So I know there are arguments out there around the science of retrieval and science of memory that suggests that it's just rote learning. But actually, when we look at the idea of schema and the visual of a spider web, building schema involves learning new information by connecting it to existing items of knowledge. In this ever-growing web, 
so that the more students know, the more they are able to learn. By constantly adding to schema, students develop a thorough and rich understanding of the world. So it's not just about rote learning, it's about developing understanding through linking to prior learning. So I'm going to suggest that when explaining schema to students, and you might do this as part of your pastoral curriculum perhaps, the spider web is quite a good visual and helps them to understand that each piece of knowledge adds to this ever-growing web. It also means you can explore questions with them, such as what would happen if the web didn't have enough connecting lines, eliciting answers such as this would make it less secure and more susceptible to breaking. So we, we need to keep revisiting knowledge. It's the same with knowledge. The more pieces of knowledge we have to interconnect with more uh, new pieces of knowledge, the more structurally secure our understanding will be. The fragility of a spider web, however, also helps demonstrate the delicacy of knowledge. If knowledge is not revisited, our schema may disintegrate. Just as spiders keep spinning their webs, we need to keep revisiting knowledge, making it secure and adding to our schema. Essentially, we, we use it or we lose it. So with knowledge, we use it or we lose it. OK, so revision then. Um, the three stages. How do we reimagine it? I suggest we start with the why. Students understand the principles of effective revision. Students are just like teachers. You know, if we were doing CPD with teachers, we would start with the reason behind the CPD. Why is it important? It's the same with students. They don't necessarily need the finite details that um, us as teachers may want to understand of the science of memory, for example. But a broad understanding of why we're doing it in the way that we're doing it will help with motivation and help with understanding. So understanding the principles of effective revision, starting to see why certain methods are more beneficial um, than what we might call traditional revision. Then the all important how. Um, so students develop this toolbox of strategies to use for effective revision that are repeatedly modelled to them in lesson. It's really, the modelling part is really important um, and I'm going to talk later about how we might approach this. Then eventually um, students can independently revise at home by selecting tools from their revision toolbox that are both effective and non-threatening so they're accessible for all. There's a clear connection between the powerful knowledge of the curriculum, assessment and revision so they can see how all those things connect. And ideally, there's a shared understanding of this as well. So what we're trying to do is empower students through offering them these strategies that they can take away and they can use. It becomes a powerful part of learning. So it goes way beyond that restrictive idea that revision is just for exams. It's about remembering important learning. It's active and not passive and every strategy I talk about today will be active. It's purposeful so things like you might set a revision task that you are going to offer feedback on the next lesson and explicitly link into the learning in that lesson they can see that connection. It's explicitly and routinely modelled. It's a regular habit from year seven or early, earlier so study is normalised for students. It's just a normal part of their learning. It's metacognitive, it's accessible for all, it involves desirable difficulties but students understand that so when it is effort, effortful, when it is hard, they understand the benefits of those desirable difficulties. It shouldn't feel impossible but it should feel difficult at times. It's spaced and it's interleaved, it enables a smooth transition between school and further and higher education and there is a semantic shift to positive language around revision and possibly rewards as well and it may be social as well. So what does the word revision actually mean? I am going to argue this might be our starting point with students because like I said and as we saw with the student voice revision for them is how to pass an exam potentially. If we look at the morphology, which is beneficial not only to debunk some of those ideas that students have around revision, but also beneficial because it's looking at creating a culture where we celebrate words and we investigate words and, and we want that as well for our students. It's part of a literacy rich school. Um, 
And then we can see that the prefix re simply means again, vision is related to looking. So revising is simply looking again at something that's been learned. It has nothing to do and no definition that you look up of revision will mention exams or grades or tests or assessments. So really debunking and re rethinking, going back to the pure definition of revision, it's become something monstrous, but it shouldn't be. Um, it's a polysemous word, which means it has more than one definition. So it is the study of information that's been studied before. But the second meaning is a set of changes that corrects or improves something. These are both skills we want our students to have. But importantly, they're both positive. They're both very, very positive language. Um, so it does not need to be something that provokes anxiety in our students. Okay, so ineffective revision versus effective approaches to study. I think essentially we've looked at a lot of these traditional approaches. Um, so I'm going to look straight at the right hand side of the table, the effective approaches to study, because these are the things I'm going to focus on in the second half of the presentation. Retrieve taking, which is a strategy from powerful teaching. So instead of just rereading our notes, students are going to have this more active strategy of retrieve taking, which I will go through in the second section. Self quizzing, again, active, involves retrieving things from memory. Teaching, using stories and analogies, self explaining. Spaced and interleaved, metacognitive, social. So you might have a revision buddy. Normalized, desirable difficulties, lifelong study skills and habits. It may use dual coding, so there may be use of visuals to help with that learning process. Elaboration, use of how and why questions in order to cement our learning and concrete examples. Okay, so moving on to part two, and this is probably the part that you were particularly waiting for because everybody wants those practical strategies to take back to the classroom, to embed within your curriculum as to how to build that culture of effective study in your school. So this next slide is really a very holistic approach to revision. So revolutionary curriculum, first of all, just making sure that your curriculum is brimming with powerful knowledge, almost like irresistible knowledge, so that students want to revise, they want to remember that learning. Um, and I'll give an example, year seven, we've just been studying Kennings as part of our study of Beowulf. And they all stayed, well, they didn't all stay behind, sorry, a group of them stayed behind at the end of the day, wanting to guess what these Kennings were describing and have a longer discussion about them. So they were really buying into that irresistible knowledge and, and wanting to learn more about it. We're all very passionate about our subjects, aren't we? So knowing that your curriculum is full of powerful, irresistible knowledge is a joy. <laughs> Um, calling all comrades, so just thinking about your stakeholders in your school, so how are you going to get governors, teachers, students, parents, how are you going to get them all on board with this revision revolution and I will suggest some strategies for that through the second half of the presentation. Junior revolutionary, so how might you utilise older students, for example, in order to demonstrate study skills to younger students and using them as mentor mentors. Um, evidence shows that using older students as mentors for their peers is extremely effective. So this is definitely a strategy worth exploring. Revolutionary lessons, so using principles like rose and shine to ensure you're constantly reviewing learning, but also that it's chunked so that students don't experience cognitive overload. And it's back to those category three students where this is absolutely crucial. Revolutionary coaching. So we talked earlier about making the revision process social. So students as coaches for one another. I love this one because I think our education system is very much set up to pit students against one another. It's competitive. One student failing is as a result of another student passing and that kind of um, you know, ranking system that we have in terms of um, allocating grades. So I love this kind of shift to students actually relying on one another for success and, and they're a team, they're a pair, and you know, they're really proud of each other's work and each other's successes. Revolutionary well-being, so looking at your pastoral curriculum and whether you can use that to teach the science of learning to students. 
senior revolutionaries. So looking at things like your senior management in school and how and, and also um, year managers and how they might deliver assemblies on effective revision. Revolutionary home study. So how can we utilize homework? Um, what you will love about this one is it's making it marking free. OK, but making it part of that study process. Um, and then finally, I know it's slightly cut off the screen there, but just um, V the revolution. So how do we sustain that revolution? How do we keep it all going after the initial momentum? OK, so at the beginning of the Revision Revolution book, there is an audit. And I really recommend you having a look at that audit and just auditing where you're up to on your revision journey, because it might be the first chapter, for example, is on curriculum. And it might be that you're really happy with your curriculum. Actually, um, you feel like there's lots of cultural capital. It's full of powerful knowledge and that powerful knowledge is clear and explicit to students and everyone's really on board with the curriculum. Curriculum. Therefore, you might skip past chapter one and you might start by looking at chapter two, which focuses on staff CPD and making sure everyone's got a shared understanding of retrieval practice, why it's important, what effective strategies we can be looking in at in the classroom, etc. So obviously tailor it, personalise it to where you're up to on your revision journey. OK, pastoral revision curriculum. So there may be, and again, it depends on your context, but often there is space in the pastoral curriculum to have a look at revision. I don't know that at my school, we're just starting to do this now. We're starting to look at lessons and developing lessons that explicitly teach effective study, and it's so powerful. So I've suggested an outline here, but again, tailor it to your school and where you're up to on your revision journey. In the book, it looks at, and, and there are lessons as well as um, as part of the book, you can access PowerPoint resources. Year 7 looks at demystifying revision. So everything we've talked about, um, um, debunking what revision is, what retrieval is, and then looking at some concrete strategies like self-quizzing, brain dumps and flashcards. So just kind of drip feeding really, doing it bit by bit. So just introducing them to those first three really effective strategies and really simple strategies accessible to all for year seven. Then looking at how we learn, um, introducing to desirable difficulties and a little bit about how memory works as well. And, and as I talked about schema and that visual of the spider web. Session three, automaticity and the benefits of overlearning. So students understand that, you know, by revisiting something again and again and again and really embedding it, embedding it within long term memory, they're then able to access higher order thinking. And it's really beneficial um, for accessing those more advanced, sophisticated ideas. Year 8 looks at creating an effective environment for study, so um, metacognition in particular, but it also looks at cognitive load, so removing distractions like the mobile phone and other technology. How to take notes effectively, so I, I talked about and I will talk about in more detail um, some of the skills needed in higher and further education. When I started college, I just was thrust into this environment where everyone was taking notes and I had no idea how to take effective notes. And I think we're missing a trick if we're not teaching that in school. It's such an important skill. Then looking at retrieve taking, developing notes into sentences and paragraphs. So just as we need shorthand, we also need to know how to translate that shorthand back into beautiful prose. Year nine looks at the writing process and it looks at elaboration. Now, the reason I've left elaboration until this point is because it's a bit more difficult. So asking effective how and why questions is in year nine once they've got some of those more um, basic and simple study habits embedded. Again, same with dual coding. So looking at different approaches to dual coding comes at the end of year nine. Year 10, more sophisticated study habits, so like concrete examples, analogies, anecdotes, examples and non-examples using the Freya model. So by this point, they should have that toolkit of effective study habits. So, um, sorry, effective approaches to study. 
so by this point we can kind of extend things and introduce them to some more challenging some more difficult concepts generative learning self-explaining and teaching um so those kind of oracy approaches and why they're effective and then it is important at the end of year 10 for them to know how to design an effective revision timetable and remain healthy during study season you know things like drinking water taking study breaks it's important that we address obviously the well-being side of revision as well um they should be designing a revision timetable that makes use of spacing and interleaving. So again, important that that is explicitly modelled. Okay, so I'm now going to move on to some very kind of simple, really, but effective strategies that we can be using within the classroom and that students can then use on their own at home. And the first one is a brain dump. I've also heard it referred to as a knowledge splat but it's the same thing either way so it just involves students dumping or splatting everything from their brain onto a piece of paper now you can give them a heading and the heading here is from a lesson on achilles as a tragic hero um, and the starter activity was a brain dump on heroism in the iliad so i wanted students to write down everything they can remember about that concept and obviously we've been studying it for several weeks so they should have um lots of different ideas the important thing here is that they don't look at their notes that's what makes a brain dump effective because it is retrieving it from memory it should feel hard and that's how it helps it to enter long-term memory and um, i talked earlier well I talked a lot about making revision a positive experience and there's not one student in that classroom unless i'm doing something terribly wrong that won't know something about heroism in the Iliad. Um, you know, you could even scaffold it and get them to discuss with a partner first, which, which would give them even more experience of success. So it's just that shift again in giving them accessible and effective activities that will give them a positive association with revision and they know how to do it. It's removing that revision monster. So on the next slide, slide, you can see I've put it under different headings, but lots of different things that they could have come up with. Um, you can, again, scaffold it with these headings if you want to, um, but whatever works for your curriculum. So we don't necessarily expect them to come up with all of this, but it's important that in the feedback part, of this activity they're able to go back to their notes if they're doing it independently or if they're doing it with you in class and write in any bits that they didn't get ideally in a different color or, or making them stand out in some way so again they can streamline their revision they know where the gaps are they know what they did and didn't know okay mixed retrieval quizzes there is research conducted by argawal um, that says that mixed retrieval quizzes are more effective than purely fact-based fact retrieval quizzes. So this is really important. Um, so what this is an example taken from Mr. Goodwin. It's obviously a geography example taken from his blog. And it starts with a what question. So it starts with fact-based, but then it moves to why. And then at which latitude can the Arctic ecosystem be found? So it's another kind of fact-based question, but they then have to make a link and they then have to briefly describe. So that's giving a bit more information. And finally, he gives a statement and they have to explain. So I think it's important to be aware of that research and by building up from foundational knowledge to things that are a little bit more complex and are activating those higher order thinking skills, it is more effective than purely fact-based quizzes. I've got a couple more examples of this. So this is a strategy taken from Kate Jones and it's retrieval pyramids. So if you look at the bottom layer of the pyramid, it is fact-based. So what does patriarchy mean? Which character is patriarchal? What does Prospero do? And at one scene three that could be considered patriarchal. But we then look at how and why questions how does Prospero use his magic? Why does Prospero ask Miranda if she's listening? Um, and then finally, there is an, an opinion question, really. So once they've built up all this factual knowledge and thought about some of these more elaborative questions, the how and why questions, they should have built up enough information to have a think about developing their own opinion 
on the type of father that Prospero is and being able to justify those reasons. Had I started with that question, technically students might really struggle. And obviously we've talked about desirable difficulties, but that's just a difficulty. Um, I don't want them to struggle to the point where they, they just can't answer it. Um, I want them to be able to build up that knowledge and then they can have it, they can all have a go at something a bit more challenging. Essentially, we all want students of every ability level and every starting point to access the more complex, challenging parts of our curriculum. Okay, memory platform. This is something that I have taken from Andy Farby. And again, it's another version of a mixed retrieval quiz. So there are three questions based on last lesson. Then they get a question based on last week, um, a question based on last term, but then question six connects, connects last lessons learning to last term. So question six is going to be more difficult. However, by the time they get to question six, they have activated some of that knowledge from last lesson and last term. What this, why this memory platform is fantastic is because it, takes account of spacing and interleaving as well. So it's retrieving, it's going to get harder because obviously the longer ago that learning was, the more difficult it is to retrieve, but it encourages students to retrieve learning from quite a long time ago. And we want them to remember that learning. You know, we don't want to be moving on from one term to another and have them forget everything. They will forget as we know from Ebbing House's forgetting curve, but by doing all this retrieval, we're trying to mitigate that. Okay, so this is an example of a memory platform. I've got three questions on A Christmas Carol. Then question four is looking back to like a week ago. So still on Christmas Carol. Question five is last term. So it's looking at Macbeth. And then question six is connecting Macbeth and Christmas Carol. So getting them to think about links. Um, obviously, we looked at schema earlier on. So making those connections, making those links between existing knowledge and new knowledge is really effective in developing stronger schema for our students. So metacognition then, I've mentioned this word quite a lot of times, but I haven't actually kind of explained it really. So when students are completing a study session, we want them to activate their prior knowledge. We want them to verbalise their thought process. So that might be the, te um, the teacher can model that by verbalising their own thought process in class, in lesson, but they could verbalise their thought process with a study buddy at home. Um, we want them to engage in metacognitive talk, and I'm going to talk about a couple of ways in which they might do this, and we want them to reflect on study sessions. So here are some questions that students might ask themselves, and we could absolutely make use of these questions and model them in the classroom. And then by getting students to reflect on their study sessions, it means that they should be able to set meaningful targets for the next study session. And it means that they should be able to go back to things they found more difficult to remember. And again, I'm gonna show a couple of strategies which would help them to do this. Okay, I also spoke about the importance of oracy and I'm gonna link it to metacognition here. Oracy is cognitively sticky. So what that means is that um, when students have conversations in the classroom, when they are explaining things orally to a partner, it's more memorable than if they are writing. Now, I think one of the reasons for this is because there are so many different things going on in their head when they're writing something down. The process of writing is not a natural process. So they are thinking about spelling, they are thinking about handwriting, um, they're thinking about the knowledge that they're applying, vocabulary, millions of different things, sentence construction, all these different things. When they're talking, they don't need to think about all of those things because actually, yes, we want them to speak like a scholar, we want them to speak academically, but if they're using fillers, even if they're using silence, that's fine, that's acceptable to give them that thinking time. So students, this is a quote from Tom Sherrington, students may often experience whole lessons without rehearsing using language, airing their thoughts, practicing explaining concepts or sharing ideas with others. 
And that's because there may be lessons that are completely silent or there may be lessons where students are just putting their hand up and not using any other means of feeding back to the teacher. So I have included here four strategies for avoiding that, four strategies for ensuring that students are using the practice of oracy um, and also getting that ratio up of how many students are engaging within the lesson. So this is another really important study skill. Choral response. So, you know, there might be a vocabulary word that's really difficult to break down. So we might use my turn, your turn, and we can do that um, with gestures as well for them to chant it back to us. Um, I'm a little bit mean when I do this one sometimes and I say, if I'm, I'm watching you and if I don't see your mouth moving, you're going to do it on your own. Um, timed pair share. So this is similar to turn and talk, which is um, a Doug Lemoth teach like a champion strategy. Students have a specific, uh, sorry, specified time to following silent think time to share their answer while their partner listens and probes with questions and they then swap roles. Again, I'm really strict with this. So saying to students, you may not swap roles until the time is up. You have to just question your partner and keep them talking because I don't want either of the two of them to dominate. I want them both to get that opportunity to present their ideas. And it's also great practice for them to think about appropriate questions for their par partner. Cold calling. So at the end of a time per share activity, for example, you might say, well, you might prime them, sorry, beforehand and say, OK, once you've discussed, I will be cold calling some of you. So be ready with your answers. Encourages them not to go off topic. Um, and so they know to be ready with the response and, and they're all thinking about it because Technically, if we allow hands up, a lot of students have switched off at that point. Listing and the way I present this activity is like a tennis rally. So um, you've got a certain amount of time to think about it. It could be, I don't know, man made features in the environment if it was geography. OK, now um, partner A, you're going to go first and back and forth and back and forth like a tennis rally. So again, ratio wise, 50 percent of the room are engaged at one time. Um, and then again, you might cold call students at the end of that bit of scaffolding, bit of oral rehearsal. So that just helps with the metacognition side of it, making sure every student in the classroom is explaining their learning to somebody else. Okay, retrieve taking. So I said that I would talk about this as a kind of shift away from rereading notes. This strategy comes from powerful teaching. It's very slightly different to note taking. So instead of rereading notes and trying to commit them to memory, low efficacy strategy doesn't work. Um, we make this active. So teacher pauses a lesson or student pauses their study session. Students open up a blank page or they might turn to the back of their books. Students note down what they can remember, retrieving the information from memory. They have to think hard about the content. And then there's some corrective feedback. So what did we write down? What did we forget? Why do we think we forgot that? Um, draw a box around it or highlight it so that you know that that's something that you really need to go over at home potentially. Same in a study session. Students could just go, oh, I want to revise the character of Banquo in Macbeth. Let's write down what I can, let, well, they might read something first because otherwise it's similar to a brain dump. So they might read something and um, their notes on Banquo first, then turn to the back of their books. What can I remember about that? Check it against their notes um, and give themselves that corrective feedback. Much more effective than rereading. OK, so effective study strategies so far, we have talked about mixed retrieval quizzes, metacognition, oracy, retrieve taking, but essentially anything that is active and requires desirable difficulties. Those are the characteristics of effective study. OK, so I talked about how much when we looked at the kind of overview at the start of part two how much I love coaching and peer support with revision, kind of study buddies, if you like. So different things you can do with study buddies, making revision social, is use of how and why questions, so elaborative interrogation. Paired quizzing, this probably works best with some kind of resource. So you might give students, like you might give partner A, um, some information about a character or a theme or, you, you know, a particular event in history, a mathematical equation, 
and they are quizzing their partner using that resource. You might use flashcards, which I'm going to go on to in a couple of slides time. Tip, tip, teach, try again. Very hard to say. Um, I'm going to demonstrate on the next slide. This is a really effective strategy for metacognition and a really effective strategy for study buddies. Just a minute is so simple. Um, students simply talk for one minute on a given topic. Hesitations cost a life, three strikes and you're out and you could get students in pairs timing each other. Um, it's quite a fun activity, that one. So again, just shifting that mentality from, oh, revision is hard, revision is boring, to revision can be fun. I can do it with a partner. It can feel a little bit like a game at times. But, you know, more than that, actually, it's empowering. I get to show off my knowledge. That's how we want students to feel about study and revision. OK, so tip, tip, teach, try again. Here's an example. You are going to have to train students up on this. So what I will say, a bit of a disclaimer first, is students will not just immediately be able to do this. Um, it'll require a lot of modelling and a lot of practice. But the idea is they ask their partner a question. So you might have these questions pre-prepared or they might have gone off to do a study session at home with their friend. Um, either way, students hopefully are aware of what the important powerful knowledge is. So in this example, student one asks student two, what does equivocation mean? And student two says, I can't remember. Now in a traditional classroom, that might be the end of that. The teacher tells them the answer or the student tells them the answer. But what happens with tip, tip, teach, try again is they cannot opt out. And I'll show you why. So student one gives them a tip. It relates to the witches. Student two is still unsure of oh, something to do with lying. But, they, you know, they're getting there. Um, student one gives a second tip. Yes, but think more along the lines of trickery. So they're going to need to be quite skilled in the knowledge at this point. So it's something you might do towards the end of a scheme of work, for example, or when you're revising a scheme of work, when the knowledge um, is quite good and you've practiced this process a few times. So a student says when they trick Macbeth, so they're still not quite there. In this example, they then give a third tip, which is, you know, you might not necessarily do that. It is just tip, tip, teach, try again. Um, so student two says they tell him he will be king. Well, at this point, they've still not quite got to the right answer. So student one is going to now teach them equivocation. And you might they might have a resource for this. They don't necessarily need to be able to eloquently reel off the definition of equivocation. They might have it in front of them and that's fine. So equivocation is the use of unclear language to tell half truths. For example, the witches tell Macbeth he can't be killed by any man born of woman which makes him feel invincible but the witches know Macduff was born through caesarean section this is how they trick him into feeling invincible so that's the teach part but they still can't opt out well I've taught it you now so you need to repeat it back tell me the definition of equivocation and that's the try again so they need to be switched on throughout this process they need to be listening because they're going to have to give an answer at some point in the process so that one's really powerful and again it's that shared success that both both students are supporting each other to succeed okay this is um a question frame which you may use for elaborative interrogation i've got the science of memory there and the image for a schema because i thought what you might do at this point if you like is pause the video and actually use it to test yourselves on those things but you could do it on anything you could have a visual in the middle for the classroom or you could have something else so the idea is students go down the um left hand column so they choose a STEM, what, where, when, who, why, or how, and then they go along the top to create a question. So they might say, for example, um, how can you explain the science of memory? And their partner has to explain it to them. You could combine this even with tip, tip, teach, try again, because if they don't know, they could use that process to prompt them towards the correct answer. All of these things work really well in conjunction with one another. Okay, so I said I was going to talk about flashcards, and the Lightner method is really effective because it utilizes spacing and interleaving. So the way the Lightner flash ugh, sorry, the way the Lightner method works is that all of the flashcards go into compartment one to be test ev tested every day. If they get the answer correct, they move it over to compartment two and they test themselves alternate days. 
If they get it correct again, it moves over to compartment three and they test on it every week. If, however, they get the answer incorrect at any point, their flashcard goes all the way back to compartment one and it's tested daily again. Now, the reason this is so, so beneficial for students is that the learning that they're least secure in is the learning that, that they encounter the most often. Even if they are confident with an answer, they're still testing on it weekly. So they're over learning that answer. So it really, really incorporates those principles of the science of learning. In powerful teaching, they add another bit of advice around how you might use flashcards. So first of all, retrieve. Students must retrieve the information before turning the flashcard over. It doesn't matter if they retrieve it incorrectly, but that desirable difficulty of having a go is really important in the process. Reorder the flashcards. So, you know, if I think about my five-year-old and we're doing work on his reading at the moment, if I don't vary the books that he reads, he just memorizes it. And it's the same with secondary students as well, whatever age student you're working with. If we don't reorder the flashcards, they might just have memorized them in a specific order. And that's no good when it comes to an exam or when it comes to long term learning. So shuffle the deck. Um, repeat. So students should keep the cards in their deck until they've answered them correctly three times. But I would say as an absolute minimum, you know, you might just keep them in the pack infinitely because overlearning is no bad thing. OK, Cornell notes. So we talked earlier about retrieve taking, which is one form of note taking. Cornell notes is another form of note taking, which is really clear for students. So everyone can access it and it's really beneficial. Um, one thing I would say about Cornell Notes, and I said it at the beginning of this presentation, it is not enough just to hand students the Cornell Note template and, you know, that's note taking. It needs to be explicitly and routinely modelled in class. And then ideally, eventually, they'll get to the stage where they can use it on their own. So we use Mazalit, for example, fantastic lecture series that you can subscribe to. So I might set a homework where I want students to take Cornell Notes on a Mazalit lecture. And I know they can do it because I've modelled it a number of times in class. So how it works is they write a title, um, they write notes, but they write cues that go alongside those notes. So, for example, if their note says um, Banquo is presented as a foil to Macbeth, their cue might be just the word foil possibly, or it might be a question. So how is Banquo presented? Um, once they've got their notes and their cues, they do a little summary at the bottom. So condense everything down into a couple of sentences. And then it becomes a revision resource. So ideally, what we know, what we want through our curriculum is things like exercise books becoming revision resources, because a lot of the time students don't necessarily know how to use their exercise books. But if they're full of things like Cornell notes and quiz cards and um, tip, tip, teach, try again, then they can use them for self quizzing. So all they do is they cover up the notes section and they use the cues to either quiz themselves or to get a partner to quiz them. It's great for parents as well. They've got all the answers so they can quiz their um, child. Um, it is important to include that corrective feedback again. So they would need to look back at their notes, maybe highlight the bits they weren't sure of or the bits that they got wrong and do that reflecting and that metacognition as well. Note taking symbols. So, you know, if students are using shorthand, if they're using the language of note taking, it needs to be modelled to them. So I've included suggested note taking symbols here. Um, however, you know, you could come up with your own. Absolutely. Um, and, you know, these if they're used across the school, then they are much, much more effective. You know, the more consistently that they are used, the better they are for students and the more routinely they'll be using these abbreviations and understanding what they mean. However, having said that, you might slightly adapt them from subject to subject, which I think is also fine. Um, but sorry, just to go back to that a second, that back to the idea of note taking a second. Um, it, again, it's one of those skills where 
they do need it for higher and further education. So I think explicitly teaching those abbreviations is really empowering for students. So here's an example based on Leitner method. The cues are there down the left hand side in the form of questions and the notes are in the body. And then you've got a summary at the bottom. So again, the idea is that students would cover up the notes and quiz themselves and check their answers. So we know that they're getting high quality answers. It's another way for students to revise where they're not using Google. And I always say to my students, if you can't find the answer to these questions in your exercise book and your notes, then I'm doing something wrong. Curriculum wise, I'm doing something wrong. You should be able to find that powerful knowledge by looking in your book. I don't want you on the internet Googling things because you might come up with all sorts of wrong information. Okay, um, turning notes into full sentences also important, so modelling that process. And actually this one here, um, if you just look over on the left hand side where it says flashcard equals card with a small amount of info, questions on one side, answers on the other, students test themselves and reorder cards. You can include some desirable difficulties here if you like. So I've said that they need to include a noun, a positive. So a flashcard, a card containing a small amount of information has questions or cues on one side and an answer on the other. Students use flashcards to test themselves, reordering the cards and retesting. So you could get them in your subject area to include certain high level vocabulary words when they translate their notes into full sentences or include certain aspects of grammar, certain technical kind of sentence construction things that is going to elevate the sophistication of their answer as well. OK, retrieval cards. This is another strategy from Powerful Teaching. What is lovely about this is that it is so simple. Every single student can access it, particularly if your revision, your study ties in with your curriculum. They, they can do it. Um, and one of the reasons they can do it is because they're going to star the piece of information, the item to know or the question if they know it. And then they're going to write in the answer from their brain. So they're going to retrieve it. If they don't know it, they're going to question mark it. But there's no opt out here. So, OK, you've question marked it and that's absolutely fine. It's good to make ourselves aware of what we do and don't know and what we need to prioritise in revision. But you're still going to write the answer and you're going to write it by looking it up. Again, they should be able to find it in their exercise book or they should be able to find it through lesson resources. If you booklet your curriculum, for example, it might be in um, the resources, the booklet, the um, scheme of work materials. Doesn't really matter where it is as long as they can find it to write in that answer. So multiple benefits of this retrieval card. One, it's accessible to all. Two, it shows what they know and what they don't know. Three, there's no opt out. They all should come to lesson. I often set this as homework, by the way, and then the starter activity will be going over it. So they're getting that, that feedback and they can see how purposeful it is in terms of linking it to the lesson. Um, and then they, they're all expected to come with it filled in, either from memory or from looking it up. OK, so, oh, sorry, I meant to just pause the video at that point to see if you wanted to have a go at that. So if you have had a go at that, then these are the answers. OK, and I will let you um, have a look at that and see what you managed to get, what you start and what you question mark. OK, power tickets. This is another one from Powerful Teaching, but I have actually adapted it. So it's not too similar to a memory platform in a way, because what you do is you have learning from today, yesterday, last week, last month, last term, last year. So it's spacing out that learning. It's getting them to retrieve things from quite a while ago and um, helping that to enter long term memory. They write one fact, a second fact, a third fact. Now, for me, I think that's absolutely fantastic and I've completely stolen it, but I wanted to make it more of a mixed retrieval activity. It is just fact based. So I added this final row at the bottom there where it says develop your facts into one beautiful sentence, include a noun, a positive, relative clause or present participle. Now, I, I do think it's beneficial in most subjects, possibly not math to get them thinking about how they construct their sentences. Um, however, you don't have to include that bit, but I chose to because part of our curriculum is teaching them, explicitly teaching them these sentence constructions. So it then gets them just to apply that knowledge and to think about some of the higher order thinking um, 
so it's just an extension really that you may or may not want to have a go at but this is again a great one for homework a great one to use at the start of lessons going over students answers cumulative learning so i mentioned this earlier self-explaining and teaching um really really effective um self-explaining students can do on their own so it, some examples here in maths or science students might explain the process they will use before completing questions or a practical so they might sit at home with their parent for example with an older sibling with a friend and explain um the process that they're going to use for a question a homework question or um something they're doing as part of their study Helps reduce cognitive load because they've already thought about it, they've already explained it and verbalised it. We know that oracy is cognitively sticky, so that's a benefit as well. Allows students to focus on the learning over the mechanism of carrying out the work. Second example, in RS or history, students might explain the origins of the views of a particular faith or political party on a topic being studied. Teaching massively beneficial and this is something that is a bit more complex so in the pastoral curriculum i have left it till year 10. but the benefits of teaching i mean as teachers we know don't we that by going through the planning of a lesson then going through the teaching of it the explaining of it and then going through the reflecting and how you do it different next time you massively deepen your subject knowledge and it's the same with students so the preparation stage they have to select and organize their knowledge and their understanding of the materials they have to think hard about how to present it and making what selections they're going to make um, they should have access either to teacher guidance at this stage or some high quality resources to avoid any misconceptions but they could do it at home utilizing resources from class to teach it perhaps to their parent and again it's just that experience isn't it of showing off that knowledge and really enjoying the study process explaining stage students actively engage in the materials again selecting and possibly reorganizing drawing on their prior knowledge and therefore developing their schema in order to make ideas as clear as possible um, interactions such as deep questioning involve students reflecting on their own understanding and restructuring it as necessary so it's really really useful for them to go through that teaching process there's a famous einstein quote where he says you only really understand something where you can when you can explain it to a four-year-old and i think that is um relevant here um quote from enza and enza's book on generative teaching so they they said sorry from what watson and bush the first one is from from their book on different studies around the science of learning so students had been expected to teach the material remembered more um, than if there was going to be a test. So teaching actually more effective than testing. And then Enza and Enza expecting to teach something helps them categorise, encourages them to go through the learning thoroughly and prepare for tough questions, self-explanation and elaborative interrogation. I've certainly experienced this when I've taught year 13 and I've thought I've got someone in there who's more well read than I am. I'm going to have to be ready for them testing their no my knowledge. So I need to know this inside out. And again, it's the same with students. It's that motivation to know the material really well. Engaging parents in curriculum. Uh, sorry, engaging parents in revision. So we've taught loads about revision buddies and parents can act as revision buddies. They can quiz their child using Lightning Method flashcards they can quiz them using their Cornell notes pages in their exercise books um, and they can use any other re revision resource where the answers are provided so parents feel confident they've got the answers in front of them and their child gets to show off their knowledge so it should be really enjoyable for enjoyable for both parents provide an environment conducive to study so a quiet space um, no distractions maybe the promise of a reward afterwards because that is that that always helped me with my revision knowing that i was going to go and watch eastenders or have a bar of chocolate or something parents can ask their child what went well in a study session so getting them activating those metacognitive skills by reflecting what their child struggled with why that might be and entering into that really important dialogue around the focus of the next study session so making it purposeful reflecting on successes and areas for development 
tell me three is a really good one because often you may have experienced this yourself when you ask your child um you know what went well or or how was your day you might get quite a monosyllabic response so even with my five-year-old I'll get good and that's that doesn't elaborate um so tell me three is quite useful what are three things that went well what are three things that need more work what are three things you remembered easily just that slight semantic shift that we've talked about just a minute I explained earlier and, and again that's a great one for parents to to do with their child where again their child can show off their knowledge by talking about it for a minute and they're nice short activities as well revision doesn't have to be sit in your bedroom for two hours on your own completing a past paper it, it could be short bursts that can be a lot more effective and social and enjoyable Okay, so I'm going to wrap it up at this point um, because you've been listening for a very long time. Um, I'm going to finish by suggesting 10 steps towards building a culture of effective study in your school. We know rev revolutions take time, so the steps need to be almost like slow and steady wins the race um, to make it sustainable. And really, I've only just touch the tip of the iceberg when it comes to effective study there are lots of chapters in the book that I haven't really talked about um, so if you would like more information please do get in touch so firstly what foundations are in place for us to build our revision revolution on there's little point getting students revising effectively if we don't have a curriculum full of powerful knowledge worth revising that irresistible learning we need every stakeholder on board so year seven is a great starting point because they are typically keen little sponges so starting by debunking ideas of revision in year seven introducing them to the science of learning in the pastoral curriculum um, and introducing them to concrete study skills as well we also need to sell our revolution to staff and parents parents will be very winnable as long as we're clear and transparent about how the, the strategies will help their child um, so you could use, I haven't had time to talk about this much today, but you could use things like newsletters and parents evening to really engage student, uh, parents sorry, in that revision revolution process. No whole school initiative can really be successful without the support of senior management, which means having them at the front of staff training, even if they're not presenting, um, a consistent positive language from senior management around revision and its importance. Common language is important as well. So, you know, imagine a cohort of students that enter college and university speaking eloquently about metacognition and schema and how this links to their progress as self-regulated learners with autonomy over their achievements. And you can get that shared language through, you know, making sure those study skills are all over school they're in lessons they're in homework they're in assembly they're in the pastoral curriculum that common language will come very quickly modeling is crucial there's no point as i said just handing students cornell notes template and a list of abbreviations it needs to be explicitly and routinely modeled hand in hand with modeling goes opportunities for students to practice so in class initially, because they'll need that teacher guidance and support, but eventually it can be homework. And then the next stage is for students to be able to independently revise, selecting different strategies, um, kind of hand picking them, what's appropriate, what's useful as they move through that revision process, that revision journey, and they get to understand which strategy is useful when. Um, ask senior management and heads of department if you can review the homework policy to make revision a priority. So, you know, if you're using things like the retrieval cards as revision, there's no marking needed. You're just going to go over it in class. And it's also going to improve outcomes because students are effectively revising through the homework that you're setting. We haven't looked at number nine um, assessment and feedback in, in detail today, but um, make sure that assessment aligns with revision you know we've touched on the fact that curriculum assessment and revision all need to align they all need to be covering that powerful knowledge and then finally a pastoral curriculum and assembly timetable that includes some science of learning will reinforce all of this and empower students by teaching them about the science of learning and the purpose of the revision strategies they will learn and practice 
So at the bottom of the slide here, you've got my contact details and please do get in touch. I would love to hear about any schools or practitioners that are embedding these strategies. Um, I would love to help you um, and give you any guidance or support with particular um, things that you might be doing. So please do get in touch. But thank you so much for watching and listening and I hope you enjoy your vision revolution and good luck.